Well, welcome to Networking 101. Um, we're just going to cover the very basics of networking today. So, hope you are expecting that. <laughs> uh, disclaimer, uh, we're not going very in-depth. We're covering really basic stuff about networking. And that's just so that you can gain an understanding of what people are talking about when they're talking about their networks. Um, if you are experienced with networking, I would maybe suggest the Wireshark talk next door. <laughs> um, but we will have a question and answer period at the end, and um, you can throw anything at me and I'll see if I can answer it. How's that? So, who am I? I am Bryce Fox, um, also known as Pally on the SyncCon Discord. Um, I've been in IT for about 30 years, a little more than that. And um, I've done quite a few different jobs, as you can see there, but um, uh, I'm currently an enterprise IT architect for the University of Utah. Um, I'm married with five mostly adult children, <laughs> and um, I enjoy gaming with them and history podcasts and great food and great shows and traveling to great, the great outdoors, so I enjoy great things, right? Um, so I consider myself a cybersecurity advocate. I try to, to um, advocate for, for more secure environments in my, um, in my role at the University of Utah. Sorry, mic trouble here. All right, I'm also a St. Con committee member. And so I get to run the St. Con store. <laughs> and so, ah, uh, dang, you know what? We're out of the St. Con store badges already. <laughs> so we were given those out at the St. Con store. But come visit us at the St. Con store and see if uh, there's something there that you would like. All right, here's an outline of what we'll, we will be talking about. Um, Again, if these things are way familiar to you, there's probably a better talk for you. But this is what we'll go down, starting with LANs. Apparently this guy is pretty excited, Leonard, about his LAN. Go, I'm losing my mic again. All right, all right. So, practicalities of local area networks. Um, as an intro, uh, LANs have evolved over time. And uh, here we see an example of some different topologies for LANs. Um, a star shape, a ring, a bus. Um, one of the early networks that I worked on was a bus where everything was literally on the same coax cable and just connectors up to each computer off of that cable, just kind of a splice in. Um, so your computers all connect up to a LAN or a local area network. Um, and uh, all network endpoints or hosts, as we call them, connect to a LAN. Your LAN is sometimes referred to as being on the same wire, even though they're typically not literally on the same wire. They're a bunch of wires aggregated together, right? So here's an example of wires aggregated together through a hub, okay, a network hub. And, um, Traditionally, uh, LAN, a LAN shares a bridge domain and thus shared broadcast domain and thus a shared collision domain. 
and um, that that is, uh, you know, those are terminology that you may find useful in conversations about networks or lands, bridge domains, broadcast domains, where traffic is sent to every every host on a LAN, or um, a collision do domain, which we don't hear much about collision domains anymore, and you'll see why here in a second. Um, so this was true, all true about network hubs until they were replaced with network switches. And with a network hub, the traffic would talk all over the network. And so um, a collision on the network could happen within the hub. So, you know, one host tries to talk, another tries to talk. They both try to talk, but they run into each other. And so they couldn't cross talk on the network. And so um, that collision domain was across all computers with a hub where when we moved to switches, we, um, we were able to reduce that collision domain down to just the wire between the switch and the host. Um, and that made it a lot more efficient for hosts to be able to talk on the network and uh, reduced that kind of error on the networks. All right, so a bridge domain consists of all the hub or switch ports in the LAN. You can even add additional ports through an additional switch. Um, but all of those ports act together as a LAN and all of the hosts off of the ports on either one of these switches would be considered a LAN or a local area network. Um, a LAN has some broadcast traffic that is sent to all ports and that is referred to as a broadcast domain. So if, if a host on the network is trying to talk to and find out something that it doesn't know, it, it might send a broadcast out on the network and that broadcast would go to every endpoint, every host on the LAN. Um, LANs adhere to the IEEE 802 dot standards and Ethernet bridging, which is our most common form of networking today, is considered IEEE 802.1, just in case you hear that somewhere. <laughs> Um, addressing on a LAN uh, is based on a MAC address or media access control address. Um, each network interface card has a MAC address and um, that, is a, that MAC address is assigned by a manufacturer. It's, a, it's supposed to be unique. There's occasions where <laughs> it's not always been unique, but um, the first three uh, hexadecimal numbers of a MAC address um, indicate the manufacturer and then the last three should be a uniquely assigned address by the manufacturer. Um, if you're wondering about who the maker of a particular device is, you can do a MAC address lookup. Search on the web for MAC address lookup and you should be able to find a site that will tell you who the manufacturer of a particular network interface card is. Um, so, uh, computers on a network uh, can communicate if they know each other's MAC address. Um, at first, they don't. And um, they... Uh, the, they, they store MAC addresses in a table called an ARP table. Uh, they use an, a protocol called uh, Address Resolution Protocol, um, which is ARP. And they, when they discover 
a MAC address that's on their LAN, they will deposit that in their ARP table to, hey, I might reference this again, I might use it again, I might talk to them again. Um, computers can do an ARP broadcast to learn the address of other computers, but that learning is aided by switches these days. So a lot of switches these days are pretty smart and they keep their own MAC address table. And so they can sometimes answer, do a proxy response and, and get the job done faster as far as discovering a MAC address on, on the network. Um, uh, so for ARP to truly be effective, it needs to have a name or an IP address or an inter-networking protocol address assigned to it. Um, so we use TCP IP protocol stacks to assign the computer an IP address to be translated to a MAC address used within the LAN. And so here's an example of what ARP looks like, um, how it might work. Um, so in this case, system A is saying, uh, it's sending out a broadcast onto the network and it says, I'm looking for something, uh, I'm looking for the physical address or the MAC address of a node with an IP address of 141.23.56.23. And so in the, the example you see there, this broadcast would go to all of the computers on the LAN. Uh, system B would hear the broadcast, and they would, and that system, that host, would respond, um, and they would say uh, the node physical address is and their MAC address. So, and they know that because they own that address. They have that address assigned to them. So. All right, so there's a thing called VLANs, and we've heard of virtualization in our world today, and virtualization applies to LANs as well. Um, so uh, modern switches are able to group their physical ports into virtual LANs, so you can split your switch into VLAN 1 and VLAN 2, and um, you can do more VLANs in that. Um, but uh, this, a, a switch then carries multiple VLANs or broadcast domains. So that in that way, you separate the broadcast domains into two in this case, or however many VLANs you set up. Um, and then uh, interconnected switches can carry multiple VLANs across one interconnect by a method uh, known as VLAN tagging or IEEE 802.1Q. Um, sometimes it's referred to as a trunk um, or a, a VLAN trunk or a, or a tagging trunk. You know, you'll hear different terminology that people use, or a, a dot one act, or a dot one Q trunk. S sorry. So let's see. Also, between the two switches in this diagram, you can see that both switches can carry both VLANs. So you can have switch uh, ports on one switch that that are serving VLAN 1, but then also on a remote switch, another switch in another room on another floor of the building or something that serves that same VLAN. Um, and you can do that with multiple VLANs as, as well. Um, so you can't talk between VLANs or LANs without uh, defining a path for them to talk to each other. Even if they're defined on the same switch, they don't have a path to each other, to talk to each other, 
without introducing routing. And so um, routing is done based on an internetworking protocol or IP. Um, simple routing configurations will often use static or manually set, not automatically chain, changeable routes. So, so just static routing or more complex routing configurations will often use dynamic routing protocols such as OSPF and BGP. Um, for example, here's a router introduced into this environment and, and we can trunk uh, those two VLANs to the router. The router can then bridge the, the gap or provide a gateway between those two networks. Um, more modern networks um, are typically using a multi-layer switch to do this. So it's a switch, but it has um, what we call layer three. Sorry, I'm getting a call. Should silence my phone, huh? Sorry. Um, and so uh, a multi-layer switch provides that routing layer or layer three, as we often call it. When we talk about routing, we're talking about layer three. Now I'm gonna to get to what layer three means here in just a second when we talk about the OSI model, but wanted to point out that wired and wireless LANs exist. You can have either or both. You can even connect them together to where they're the same network. Um, so. You can have uh, elements of, of a LAN that are wireless and elements that are wired. Although that's probably not considered a best practice. <laughs> but that's typically what we do in our homes, right? All right, now for the seven layer burrito. They don't make those at, at uh, Taco Bell anymore, apparently. But. We used to, in trying to remember the layers of the OSI model, we used to refer to it as the seven layer burrito because there's seven layers of the OSI networking model. And OSI is a standards organization, an international standards organization that um, defined this model for um, uh, inter-networking. And, um, um, so it, uh, the model is split into host layers um, and media layers. And this kind of has a lot to do with software and hardware. But then there's some crossover between there. So um, let's go over the lower layers here first. Um, the, the lowest layer on the OSI model is the physical layer. Um, this involves things like network interface cards, um, coax cable, CAT6E cable, wireless, uh, hubs, repeaters. So anything that maintains an electric signal over the wire, that's kind of your physical layer or layer one. Um, layer two of the OSI model talks about frames. Um, it defines segments of data or, or groupings of data as frames of data. Um, this involves um, our common networking uh, layers of, of um, well, Ethernet, PPP, or which is point-to-point -point protocol, switch, uh, switches, bridges. So this is just one layer of intelligence uh, up from like the signal. And then uh, the third layer would be the network layer. Um, this is where we introduce 
protocols like internetworking protocol IP, um, as well as some of its components like uh, ICMP, IGMP, uh, IPsec. But it's also important to note that uh, at this layer, uh, you, sorry, <laughs> you can perform filtering. Um, so firewalls can act on data on this layer. And, and more modern firewalls have ways to inspect uh, data on the wire and be able to, to act on more than just this. Um, but let's look at the upper layers here. Uh, the transport layer, layer four, also is filterable. Um, there are a few firewalls that will look at some, whether there's suspicious things going on with some of the layers above that, but, but very little beyond that. They, um, they might confirm that HTTP traffic is what it says it is, you know, but not a heck of a lot of interrogation into that traffic uh, beyond just basic filtering that can be done based on TCP, which is trans, uh, uh, Transport Control Protocol, or UDP, um, which is User Datagram Protocol. Um, these protocols are used to um, control the end-to-end -end connections and describe basically how to expect a connection to, to link up. Um, you'll often hear people r refer to uh, what port is that, what, what port does that service talk on on the network, or you know what port is open on your server for that. And we're talking about TCP and UDP ports when we're talking about that. Um, so uh, those ports are just numbers that, that describe um, what, basically what protocol you're talking. And again, filtering can be based on those ports. So it's often important to know if you're running a service on a server what those ports are. Um, so that you know how to tell someone who manages the firewall, hey, I need this port open and I need this port open because my server is listening on those ports. Uh, so layer five, the session layer, um, sync and send to port, APIs, sockets, windsock, um, the presentation layer is layer six. Um, so we have syntax, it's kind of a syntax layer, um, kind of describes uh, formatting of files and of, of um, uh, encryption, things like that. Um, and then seven is the application layer. Um, it's the end user layer. It's uh, kind of what what the end user sees when they're looking at their computer screen is, is layer seven or the application layer. All right. So if we combine them, that's kind of what it looks like there. And the OSI model is, is a theoretical model. Um, it's kind of the uh, du jour standard. Um, but the de facto standard in our day is T the TCP IP model. And right next to it there, I've put the TCP IP model, which in a lot of ways kind of groups the session, presentation, and application layers into one layer because they kind of get mixed around. And, um, and really all of that is handled by software. Um, so the programmers of the software can kind of define how that 
all happens there. And really that involves the packaging of, of data to be transported, things like that. Um, the transport layer, again, we're dealing with TCP and UDP. When we look at the, the far right there is the implementation, the TCP IP stack. Um, every computer that is on the internet or your local area network typically will have an IP address and will be running a TCP IP stack. Um, and then um, you can see in the stack there's some different elements of how it's implemented. Um, in the application area we see some different applications that that are defined there and and like I said the different layers the session presentation and application could be um, handled all together in, in one process or separately and, and layered depending on how the programmers wrote software but then when we get down to C TCP and UDP that kind of defines how that that transport between hosts is going to work. Um, and then there's down in the physical and data link layers, we've got Ethernet, which is probably our most common form of network these days, and then uh, token ring, which is totally obsolete, and ATM, which is pretty darn obsolete, which we, we don't have very many ATM networks around these days, I don't think. I hope not. And then frame relay as well. Although I think there are still a few frame relay connections around. This is kind of how the OSI stack works. So you have computer A has their own stack and the application, uh, the software builds data files and formats them and encrypts them at the layers five, six, and seven, and readies them, packages them for transport. And then those packages get called segments at the transport layer. And if you were in the Wireshark class next door, you would maybe talk about, oh, I see the network segments, or I see at the next layer down, the network layer, the packets. They talk about packet captures and, and pa uh, capturing the data on the wire. But this model is how the data is prepared and then passed down the stack all the way down through packets, frames at the data link layer, and then bits at the physical layer. And at the physical layer, it's just signals. It's just electrical signals, ones and zeros, passing on the wire. And then when it gets to the other end, computer B, it passes back up the stack. And so, so those physical ones and zeros are converted back to frames. And um, uh, then to packets, and then to segments, and, uh, and then eventually processed by software to, to determine how to decode it and ingest the data. So that's kind of how it's envisioned that the OSI model works. So, I don't know how many of you are techies in here, but I'm a techie, and I <laughs> sometimes get frustrated when everyone's asking me questions, but that's kind of a funny meme I found, just to lighten the mood. So, next uh, we're gonna talk about IPv4 CIDR block notation. Um, IPv4 is what most IP addresses uh, that we're familiar with are based on these days. Um, even though IPv6 exists and is in, in pretty high use, uh, mainly in China, <laughs> 
but uh, some of the big carriers use it as um, a transport for um, their backbones. Um, but we're going to focus on IPv4 because that's what's most familiar on your LAN, on your local area network. So here's an example of an IP address. Um, in fact, this is a Dixie College IP address. <laughs> um, so 144.38.112.14. And um, that's what it looks like in binary. So each of these numbers separated by a dot is called an octet. And the reason it's called an octet is because there's eight um, binary numbers that represent that, that really are the actual address. And um, those binary numbers are combined to make a decimal number between 0 and 255. And, and that's how those, those work. Um, in the table here, we can see the slots of a binary octet. Okay, and over in the first slot on the right, you see the value of one is underneath it. And for everywhere, every, every slot that has a one, that means it's on, I've turned it on. And what it means is I've turned on a one, or I've turned on a two, or a four, or an eight, or a 16, or a 32, or a 64, or a 128. And if you added all those numbers up, it would add up to 255. Uh, but for instance, in the um, uh, rows below, we have a 11010100 as the binary address. But um, that, that means that I'm, I'm adding up a 128, a 64, a 16, a 4. And the, those other um, spaces, those other zeros, mean that they're zero. They're not present. They, we're not calling for them. So when you add that up, you get the number 212, which is, in this case, the third octet of of this IP address, 144.38.112.14. So, um, in IP addressing, uh, there's a concept called subnet masks. And if you've ever defined your IP address for a server or for a workstation, you probably know that you needed to define the subnet mask. And, um, it, what it does is it provides a way to uh, set the boundaries of where, what the network address is and what are the valid host addresses within the network. And so here, for instance, um, a 255.255.255.0 as a subnet mask means that the first three octets, uh, which are completely ones in binary, right? Uh, they, that means 255, right? So those are the first three octets. And then where we see zeros after that, or uh, a lower number than 255, we know that that's where the boundary is. Um, and so, in a network like what we're depicting here, you would be able to have up to 254 addresses or so in a single network. A network that is called 150 or 144.38.212. That's kind of the network address. And then the, the end portion there is, is the host's 
So, in the early days of IP addressing, there was what we called classful networks. And classful networks uh, were defined by a range of numbers for the, in the first octet of the IP address. And here we can see in this table um, a class A network would be um, from 0 to 127 and um, would have a subnet mask. subnet mask of uh, 255.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. Um, and then uh, down the line you can see the definitions of, of, you know, where those boundaries of class A, class B, and class C networks were. And what that did is it said, okay, you can, on, the only valid subnet mask that you can use within that class is this. And so for a class A, it was 255.0.0.0. And in a class B, it was two octets of 255s and 0, 0.0. And in a class C, it was three 255s and a dot 0. So um, also, if we consider that in the form of binary, um, there's the binary numbers. And those are the only valid binary numbers um, for those classes. Um, and you can see the bits that are represented there. The class A was represented by an 8-bit eight eight bit mask. Um, a class B was represented by a 16-bit mask and a class C by a 24-bit mask. And when I say bits, that's how many um, numbers are, uh, how many binary numbers are used in the definition of the network, not the hosts, okay? The definition of the network is the, the bits of, of, an, of the network portion. So, this kind of was a waste of addressing space. And they were finding, OK, we, needed, we need more addresses. And so they introduced um, what they call CIDR, C-I-D-R, or Classless Interdomain Routing. Um, sometimes we refer to um, this notation system as variable length subnet masking. Um, and so no longer did classes mean anything. Out of a class A, you could, you could break up your networks to whatever size you wanted to based on just defining what the bit boundary was. Uh, and you could, you could define them as low as, as um, uh, two. 250 or, uh, or 128.0.0.0 .0 as a subnet mask and up to 255.255.255.252 which is um, just really it's just two hosts allowed on the network and and point to point connections are an ideal situation for using a mask like that. Um, but also that bit portion, um, the valid bit portions were 1 through 30. So, you, so an IP address is 32 bits and you could define a, a, a subnet mask anywhere from 1 to, to 30 bits. So anyway, uh, so we got into a situation where we um, would call out an IP address and, and then a subnet mask, and we would say, oh, hey, this subnet mask is 255.255.255.224, OK? 224 meaning that it's a network of about 30 hosts. 
Um, there came about the notation of using a slash and then the bit number to, to help you to shorten that, to say, oh, this is a slash 27 network. And then that, that meant something to someone. And, you know, then um, like 32 uh, in the third octet became a, a valid um, boundary for a network. That was a valid network um, under classless interdomain routing. But calculating all those can be a little mind boggling. So I, I suggest you do a web search for CIDR notation cheat sheet or CIDR notation cheat sheet or CIDR notation calculator. Calculators are nice too. But, but explore a, a, one of those cheat sheets that you can find online and you can find some pretty interesting things and you can further your understanding of how those, those bit boundaries work uh, for networks, um, for classless interdomain routing. Um, but then, if you're going after a network certification, memorization is your friend. So, all right. I think I'm going to get a drink. <laughs> I thought that was a funny one. Um, they always call the installation of software uh, install wizard. So please wait for the wizard to install the software. OK. Um, so let's talk about the basics of TCP IP and the internet. Um, first of all, um, talking about addresses on the internet as IP addresses is kind of um, archaic. Um, and so we introduced DNS long, long ago, pretty early in the days of, of IP. DNS provides kind of a phone book service for the internet. So, um, it's a way for us to not have to know the IP address. And I can just say, I want to go to Microsoft.com, and I don't care what their IP address is. Um, and if I put that into my browser and, and go there, it will, uh, it will translate that for me. And so all of our computers have DNS. They use a DNS server to uh, be able to tell us, tell our computers back, oh, oh, okay, the name you asked for was this. Okay, this is the IP address that you want to connect to to get that. And so uh, with DNS, that's, that's what we get. You know, that's the way it works. And you request something, a DNS request goes out from your computer, and a response comes back from the DNS server saying, I know that, or I know how you can find out that, and helps you to find the, the correct address associated with the name. Um, you, can, you can even buy your own domain name. Uh, there's registrars out there that you can go to to buy a domain name. Um, you do have to tell them what DNS servers you want to use. A lot of registrars of, of names will even offer their own DNS servers for you to use uh, if you have an account with them. So, and, and sometimes, you know, when you pay to register with them, they'll offer those services free. Um, TCP and UDP. Uh, TCP versus UDP. TCP is, is very important to the TCP IP stack. That's why we call it TCP IP, because IP relies on TCP a lot. Um, TCP is considered connected, state memory uh, oriented, byte, a byte stream, 
ordered data delivery, reliable, error-free, relatively. Uh, does a handshake process. Um, it does, it maintains flow control, relatively slow because it requires a lot of back and forth talk. Uh, and point to point, it's one point to another. And then security elements at TCP um, are, you know, for example, SSL with TLS. Um, you see that implemented on HTTP a lot of times. Uh, so that's why we have HTTPS in addresses a lot. Um, on the UDP side, it's considered connectionless, um, stateless. So um, we don't keep track of what stage of, of talking it's in. Um, packet. <clears throat> datagrams, um, no sequence guarantee is lossy, uh, meaning it can lose data, and, and you'd expect that there can be loss and that you might, you know, say it's a phone call, you might hear a cutout of the, of the voice or something. Error packets discarded, no handshakes, no flow control, relatively fast. Supports multicast uh, security um, is done with DTLS, which actually kind of adds some elements of sequencing and um, flow control. So um, this is a, a picture depicting kind of how that works with TCP. Um, you have a conversation that starts with a, um, a request to, to ask for something and a, an acknowledgement back. So they call it a sin. A sin act is an acknowledgement. And then an act is an acknowledgement that I got the connection. I got, I got the acknowledgement back. And once that process is, that handshake is done, then with TCP, both the server and the client in this case know that they can just continue carrying on a conversation on that port. Uh, in the case of UDP, a request is sent, a response is sent back, and just kept, keeps sending the response and doesn't have any acknowledgement of whether it's received whether that data is ingested or anything. Um, if uh, we implement controls, we have to do it up in the application layer of the OSI model or the, the TCP IP model. Uh, that's where you would perform your, your software would have to perform your error checking and things like that, uh, rather than the protocol doing air checking and handshake and things like that and flow control. All right, so real quick, we're gonna just briefly talk about routing and autono autonomous systems. Um, IP routing is based on publicly known IP address uh, assignments. Um, whatever organization you belong to has typically an assignment of addresses. Um, for you to use. Sometimes there's sub-assignments uh, from an ISP uh, where you just are, are using a couple of their I, IP addresses. Um, you are supposed to route only IP addresses assigned to your organization, apparently. I don't know. Uh, I think some hackers do try to, to route other addresses. But um, autonomous system numbers, there's a registry of numbers that is used to um, determine whether um, it's a, a valid request to route IP addresses. And um, autonomous system numbers, they used to be, you could look them up uh, publicly, but uh, they've kind of hidden them a little bit more uh, to try to help 
prevent uh, spoofing of addressing. But um, we're going to see if we can go to a quick demonstration of how to use Aaron.net. Aaron in America is, is the registry for IP addresses. Um, for instance, I can go to Aaron.net um, and I can, uh, oops, oh, go. Oh. My SyncCon connection is gone. I guess I ought to show you the Aaron.net, huh? And uh, I, I can uh, put in an IP address there. Um, let's see. Sorry. For instance, I'll put in an IP address from the University of Utah. Trying to see. Oh, did I screw up? Okay. I did not. All right. So there it's showing me what network that IP address belongs to. And if you scroll down in this description here, it shows you what they call the network, what it's registered as. Uh, they show you. Um, the network range of that network, um, the CIDR block notation for that network. They show you uh, the name of it. Let's see, where's the org name? Is that the org name right there? Sorry. I should have my screen duplicated, but I don't. <laughs> um, so with the org name, you can uh, copy that, and you can do a new lookup, and you can find out, for instance, on the University of Utah. Oh, that's not it. OK, I, I think I know what it is. University is called univ-15-. Z. Uh, I can't even see. Sorry. <laughs> but anyway, um, on Aaron, you can search for and find um, various uh, network addresses and find out who they belong to. And a lot of uh, logging systems will use this to look up. Um, what, what networks belong to whom. All right. So it looks like we're out of time. And I'm sorry that I didn't calculate better. But anyway, that's some basics of networking. Um, any quick questions before I go? OK. Thank you. Have a good sync con. <laughs>